Welcome to the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network Frontiers in Sensing Forum for 2020. The theme of today's forum is Smart Sensing Bushfire Prevention, Response and Mitigation. I'm Professor Justin Gooding from the University of New South Wales and co-director of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network. Later in the program, you'll hear from my other co-director, Professor Ben Eggleton from the University of Sydney. Um, I'd like to begin with today by acknowledging trad traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and future. The objective of today's forum is to talk about bushfires and bushfire prevention, mitigation and response and the role census play in that. I think none of us can forget the cataclysmic events of this last summer, even prior to COVID-19. Sitting here in central Sydney, we had orange skies, pink sun, and barely could see out our windows, see the view you can see behind me. But that was just a reminder of how dramatic things were closer to the bushfires. Um, and so this forum is really aims to ask the questions, can smart sensing help prevent such events happening in the future? Can they help the firefighters respond uh, to the, such events and how, enable aid them in their incredibly difficult job and can smart sensing help keep them safer. This forum brings um, together leaders from universities, government, industries and the frontline agencies to define what some of the challenges are that smart sensing can help address and talk about some innovative solutions and technologies. But it's prudent to say, ask the question, what is a smart sensor? So people know that a sensor is some sort of device that responds to its environment and gives us some data that makes us make an, allows us to make an informed decision. A smart sensor will then have some way of communicating a response, um, uh, communicating to us and actually do a, give a response. An example might be the watch on my hand or my arm, that, that mirror, wing mirror in your, um, on your advanced cars telling you that something is coming too close or a fire alarm in a building that informs the fire department that there, there could be a problem. But smart sensing can be much more than that. It's behind uh, cities of smart cities of the future, the future of transport, advances in medical uh, devices, including how we respond to crises such as we're experiencing now, and food security. So the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network is a consortium of nine leading universities in New South Wales and the ACT it's funded by the New South Wales government to bring the challenges from government and industry and people with the challenges, bring them to the university of researchers to come up with innovative solutions that address major economical and societal challenges that we face in New South Wales, but where the solutions can have global impact. There will be questions and answers today. We encourage you to ask questions um, using the question the speech bubble icon located at the bottom right of your screen. We'll endeavor to answer as many questions as possible in the time available. But with no further ado, I'd like to introduce a short video by the Honorable Matt Keane, New South Wales Minister for Energy and Environment. G'day, my name's Matt Keane, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this Bushfire Prevention Response and Mitigation Forum. When I think about the potential for this forum, my mind turns to the discussions I had with officials late in January as the Gospers Mountain bushfire raged out of control. Wollamai National Park is the only place in the world where the Wollamai pine is found in the wild. It was directly in the line of fire. As the bushfire continued to burn out of control, an operation was mounted which included winching in firefighters to build and operate an irrigation system while helicopters bucketed water to dampen the forest edge. No firefighters were injured and the Wollamai Pine was saved. However, it was a close run thing. And while the operation was a success, it underscored the limits of both traditional firecraft and our current level of sensing technology. The bushfires which raged through the New South Wales over this summer were an unprecedented state emergency. Lives were lost, homes were destroyed, and communities were absolutely gutted. We must learn from the last fire season, and we must do better for the next. We are providing complete and unqualified support to the work of the Independent Bushfire Inquiry. And we are working with the NSSN because we believe in the potential for this science to help us prevent and manage bushfires in the future. 
From my own portfolio, I'd like to acknowledge the great cooperation and support from the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment to NSSM researchers to help test and develop low-cost air pollution sensors. I particularly acknowledge the commitment of Dr Tomaroy, who, and the work that has been done with the Department's climate and atmospheric scientists to move this novel sensor from the laboratory into the real world. Beyond bushfire management, we see immense potential for sensing technology to make a difference across a range of areas, from improving our understanding of a changing climate to developing a better real-time understanding of water quality. For instance, up to one quarter of koala habitat in eastern New South Wales was affected by the summer's bushfires. Koalas are tricky animals to spot and count using conventional methods. So we are very interested in the potential to use acoustic monitoring and thermal imaging from drones to detect, survey and monitor surviving koala populations. Bushfires will always be part of the Australian summer, but climate change is worsening their impact by driving longer drier periods and more heat waves resulting in worse bushfires. Climate change is no longer just a forecast. I do not want to see the events of this summer become the new normal. I do want to work with the scientific community and with members of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network to find ways for smart sensing technology to deliver real solutions to the challenges of bushfire prevention, mitigation and response. I wish you all the best for a productive forum and I look forward to hearing about new innovative measures that will help us avoid catastrophic bushfires into the future. My name is Dr Susan Parton and I'm the Chair of the Board of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network. Uh, I'd like to thank the Honourable Matt Keane for taking the time to prepare that uh, video for us. I've been Chair of the Board of the Smart Sensing Network since its foundation in 2016. And it is my privilege today to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Rob Rogers, Commissioner of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and Australian Fire Service Medalist. Rob will be speaking to us today, as Justin has already said, about remote sensing to inform community warning during fires. He first became involved with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service in 1979 as a volunteer member of the Belrose Rural Fire Brigade. In 1995, he was appointed Deputy Fire Control Officer for the Greater Taree District. Since 2001, he uh, has held various executive roles in the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, including being responsible for regional management of community safety and operations. In 2011, he was appointed Deputy Commissioner. Mr. Rogers represents New South Wales, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service on several national and state bodies, including as Chair of the Australian Fire Danger Ratings Board, Chair of the State Bushfire Arson Task Force, Chair of the Aviation Industry Reference Group and of the Aviation Advisory Committee. He is co-chair of the Incident Management Road Safety Working Group and co-chair of the Joint Operations Task Force. He was appointed Commissioner of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service on the 1st of May, 2020. Congratulations, Rob, on your appointment and welcome to this webinar today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Susan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks very much for having me. It's a privilege to be here to talk uh, amongst such esteemed colleagues and obviously know a lot more about sensing than I do. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit um, about how we use remote sensing and how in this last fire season, remote sensing played quite a large part. So as you know, and as Justin said, we have obviously had a pretty uh, torrid time during the fire season. When we've had spires up and down uh, the whole length of the state, one of the things that we need to do is focus our attention on those fires that are most dangerous to people. And to do that, we often use sensing smart sensing. We, we have aircraft that we contract to do what we call line scan images, which basically takes the image of the fire, uh, the heat density, 
um, and it shows the most dangerous part of that fire, what's burning the hottest. We inputted that into things like our uh, fire behaviour um, tools, Phoenix predominantly, and that basically gives us an understanding of the potential of that fire and what is potentially at risk. So um, those, those things are tried and true, and we've been doing that for some years, and we very much use dedicated platforms to do this. And I guess what I want to talk a little bit about is uh, what we see and how this evolving over coming years to try and get a better outcome for us for uh, understanding where uh, I guess the risks are to people, because certainly over many years now, uh, the community has come to rely on things like the Fires Near Me app, um, the type of information we put out on our website and indeed uh, public warnings in general. And to get that, that very much relies on um, sensing, remote sensing, uh, which, which really feeds all that. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, what we do now and what we're planning on doing in the future and, uh, and how we can collaborate a bit more on that. So I'll start the presentation now. So um, if we just uh, go through this, so, so you can see there, uh, emergency warnings and alerts. Uh, we have a statutory responsibility to put those warnings out um, and you can see the number of fires we were dealing with between July last year and March of this year. Um, more than 11,000 fires and more than 105 of those reached the highest level uh, emergency warning. On, on 8th of November, we had 17 just on one day. And then that resulted in 430 emergency alert campaigns. And that's the telephone uh, based system where people get text messages or, or uh, indeed voice messages to their homes. And that's obviously the ones where we have the highest level of concern for people's welfare. We obviously feed um, the, the sensing information that gets the fire maps, that feeds into these emergency alerts, the Fires Near Me campaign, but also um, social media, uh, Twitter and Facebook messages that we put out, um, and then, then again, the emergency uh, warnings themselves. So if we don't have mapping accurate and timely, then we can't put those things out. So for us, um, getting accurate fire maps, which relies a lot on those sensing technology, is critical for us to be able to alert people. So it's not a nice to have, it's an absolutely must have. So we currently contract uh, aircraft uh, through the National Aerial Firefighting Resource. Um, and you can see there, 4,800 scans, um, and, and which is obviously considerably more than the previous season. And that just shows just how many um, missions um, and we had more than 100 fires burning at any one time. So, um, so it's, it's something that uh, was very, very active. And indeed, there was competing demand for these resources because they were also um, dealing with fires in Queensland and Victoria and, uh, and even South Australia. So it was quite complex and managing priorities was quite difficult. We also, um, and you'll understand why I'm talking about these in a moment, but we also contract two lead planes to support uh, our large air tanker program. Now these uh, lead planes, they fly ahead of large air tankers and they uh, pop smoke where they need the bombing mission to happen. And you, I'm sure you've all seen where the large air tanker drops the retardant, uh, the red colored retardant to try and uh, slow down the spread of fires and indeed build fire lines. So both of these things happen uh, simultaneously often um, and uh, we see them as quite uh, complementary. And the current system is very much reliant on uh, connectivity and there's quite a level of manual handling of the data as it's, it's a, as it's captured on the aircraft before we populate it into our system. So um, I think it's around 30 minutes work. Once the image comes into our state headquarters, um, it takes before it can be fully rectified and then put into our operational systems. All of our operational systems then feed things like the fires near me and the like. So what the government has done uh, is we purchased two Cessna Citation aircraft, which uh, we're now going to multi-purpose these aircraft to do both the lead plane and scanning. So um, we've taken an opportunity to try and merge these things and get better efficiencies out of aircraft. 
um, in, in order to uh, serve both of these functions. So we've got, uh, we've purchased these jets and they're currently being fitted with these, uh, what's called an Overwatch TK9 um, scanning system. And you can see there, it's got a seven band multispectral high definition um, and it's all onboard processed. So it's, that, that, that will be really important for us. Um, it can also, one of the big things that it can do is it can fly below cloud, which the current technology is very limited to, um, you know, at a certain altitude, I think it's around 20,000 um, feet, whereas this can go lower or higher and automatically rectify the image uh, based on a, on a lower uh, altitude. And um, so we're seeing that this will be pro images will be processed significantly faster. And uh, the um, aim we've got is that uh, to once that image uh, leaves the aircraft, it automatically upload into our operational system. So we're cutting out a significant delay in trying to get that information so that we get information quicker to the community. Um, the other thing that this does is also has some automated uh, detection um, system of the um, aircraft. So it can, if it's flying towards a, um, an aircraft, uh, sorry, a fire, it can, it can um, automatically pick up for other fires and, um, and make sure that it um, highlights to the um, operator on board that there's another, there's another fire. So that's, again, is a, is a very big um, thing for us. Um, and, and it can automatically map the fire edge. So currently, and this is part of the processing, um, is it take that currently the current line scanning technology takes a raw uh, image, sends it down, that has to then have a, an actual fire boundary put on it um, from a, a GIS sense and put in there. It's not an automated process. So it's a manual process for one of our GIS operators. This will automatically do that mapping, have the fire edge, um, and it will basically be able to um, straight away put in there, uh, put into the um, system. So it's quite, uh, for us, that's a big um, change um, for productivity. Um, and if you, look, if you look there, you can see the actual, um, that's the first of the sensors managed, mounted on the aircraft. So they're not actually that big a, a sensor. So they're, they're quite new. They're, they're in, indeed, this is a brand new um, model. Um, and this will be the first time that um, it's actually been deployed in this country. So we think it's quite um, cutting edge um, and very dif different than what we've had before. You can see there, um, so just if you just think about this, about how we're multi-missioning this, so we get a fire call, you know, something burning in a, in a remote area or a fairly aggressive fire, instantly we send the, um, this aircraft ahead. Um, now, it'll obviously do the scanning of, the, um, of that fire. It will go through, it'll create an image, send straight back to our um, headquarters um, that image, and then um, it will then provide lead plane work for the, uh, the large air tanker. And then it will carry on and do scanning again. So we'll get pre-mission sensing, post-mission sensing, so we can actually start to even evaluate the effectiveness of these platforms through you know, these, these double scanning. Um, and then if you look at this, the process of it, so. We, it can then fly, fly multiple missions, scanning multiple fires, waiting for the large air tank to come, the reef load, come back, um, you know, can lead plane it again, and then, and then obviously keep doing scans the whole time. Now then when that, that image goes back to our state ops, you can see there where it will output to uh, our ICON system, which is our uh, online system we use, um, all of our incident management teams use, fires near me, social media, emergency alerts. So all of those things will feed from that. And, uh, and by speeding this up and providing a higher number of images of fires and better quality images of fires, we think that we're going to provide a much better service to people uh, with regards to them being warned about um, imminent threats of fire. The, the danger we have with all these things is that fire, you know, you're taking an image of the fire at that time, but you know, when you were talking about fires over this last season, these things were changing very, very rapidly. 
um, extremely rapidly. So what the fire was doing at, at um, you know, on, on, an, on a particular hour, if you go two hours later, it's very, very different. It's crossed a different road. So um, we're very much about trying to get more updates of these fires, understanding what, um, what they can um, do, what they potentially will do, and making sure that we're um, keeping across that change. So that, that to us is a fundamental change um, and it, it's one of, the, one of the big things that we're looking forward for this next fire season. And I guess one of the things we, we're looking at is how we integrate that as best we can. Um, we're obviously going to have an overlap um, with, a, with an existing platform as well. We're not going to sort of just throw all our eggs in one basket, but we're very excited about this new uh, generation scanners and integration to achieve um, much better outcomes. I guess one of the things that you know we need to pose the question is that this level of scanning um, has multiple sources well outside of bushfire, and from a um, government point of view, um, we go back to um, sorry. Um, so what I guess one of the things we now have to look at is to make sure that we maximise the usage of this across New South Wales for all sorts of um, uses to make sure that we're maximising that. So um, I guess the, um, the thing that we have to do is just make sure that we're maximising it. And I guess I'd be interested to understand how, um, how we, we do that in a collaborative way. Thanks, thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, Rob. I'm sorry that you're not going to hear a loud uh, clapping from an appreciative audience, but I'm sure you can imagine it. Oh, that was a very well informed and thoughtful presentation. Does throw up a lot of questions. Uh, one in my mind immediately, uh, and we'll take your last question on notice for further consideration by the Smart Sensing Network but we'll also throw that to the panel for Catherine to canvas some ideas for other uses for the, uh, for the sensors on the, on the planes, the, um, the overwatch sensors. How much do they cost? Is two enough? I think I, you said two planes with, I'm not sure how many sensors, but what are the plans for the future for deploying more? Yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. And I guess um, at the moment, um, we got two as part of the package with the large air tanker that the New South Wales government funded. Um, and I guess we have to um, see how this works, make sure the technology works as we thought it, it should. Um, and I think that the, um, the thing that, you know, and I guess this comes back to the point I made at the conclusion, if we should be and could be able to maximise the benefit of uh, using these sensors for things beyond bushfire to make sure that, you know, the people of New South Wales are getting good value for money out of these things. So I, I guess that, you know, if we can prove a concept that it works well and we get a lot of return on investment for things like this, then I think that that potentially could lead to further airframes. But I guess you, you've got to start somewhere and, um, and that's what we're doing. And, um, we're very much, I, I would like to see these things flying 24 hours a day, um, being tasked to do all sorts of things to help um, provide good sensing information back to a whole range of users. So uh, the more they're used, the better, and the more they're used, the cheaper the cost of maintaining these things are. Obviously, jets are quite expensive to maintain, um, but we think it's certainly worth the investment. And, 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 and obviously, Hence why the New South Wales government has invested in, in two of these jets. Okay, thanks. So we have some questions from the audience. The first one is from uh, Nick, who says, uh, smart sensing seems to hold a lot of promise in predicting bushfires, but according to the media, at least, it seems that on the, uh, the worst of the fire days uh, last summer, uh, the fires were well predicted. Were any fires unexpected? And, and is it only that they're well predicted because of smart sensing? 
That that's actually correct. That's 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 spot on. Um, I mean, if you look at what we did, um, certainly um, down the south coast, where we were having huge areas that were threatened, we put out these really large uh, community risk maps ahead of uh, really bad days. Now that was all informed by fire perimeter maps that we got from from sensing, and then we applied our fire behaviour um, people. And I, and I'd like to think that we have some of the best people in the country, to be honest, and indeed the world um, in New South Wales doing this. And, uh, and they provide both the, the Phoenix automated projections, but by it balanced with some manual projections. And, uh, and that's what the basis of all these uh, maps that we predicted where these fires could go. But in saying that, uh, what we did find that some of the fires actually acted a lot worse than what we even expected they, they would. And I think by... Um, constantly more scanning and then feeding that back to the models to make sure that we're constantly um, reviewing the way these models predict things, I think we can get a better product in the end. But when you, you think about it, it all still comes back to um, using sensors to get a good, uh, accurate map of where these fires are. So I think um, whilst there's a whole lot of things that go into it uh, before we get those warnings out, the Genesis is still um, an aircraft currently flying over a fire, taking an image, and then us working out based on all the other variables what that fire is going to do. Okay, thanks. We've got uh, two questions from one of our panellists, Matthew. And uh, the first one is, um, can the planes fly at night? And the second is, can they help uh, reduce the presence of the firefighters in the field? Well, certainly the planes can fly at night, absolutely. And, um, and, and indeed, often that scanning work is done at night because um, it, it's just a bit of a quieter period and, and things are, and the fires are a bit more stable. Uh, so they're not putting up so much because um, sometimes, you, you know, the, these fires get to such a magnitude, uh, they start creating their own weather systems over the fire themselves. And we saw that numerous times this last fire season. So sometimes at night, it's actually better to, to scan these um, these fires. I, I, I don't think it's going to stop firefighters being in the field, but I think what it does do is to make sure we're putting firefighters where they're really needed at the time. So it's about being smart about where we put our firefighters, and we do that by good intelligence. And that's what these sensors do. They give us good intelligence, and they make sure that they, they very much inform um, us. I mean, it, 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 we get raw information, we turn that into intelligence, and we make decisions and smart decisions based on that so and that's very much founded on having good sensor technology in the beginning okay thanks so we have a technical question about the uh, about the sensors uh, the understanding is they use visible and infrared imaging what other sensors sensing would be useful well I think um, I mean we did talk about um, lidar in, uh, in regards to this, whether there's some application for LIDAR. And I think um, we're still quite open to whether that would be a benefit. I think, um, and look, and I'm not an expert in this area, so I don't profess to be, but I think the, um, the time um, to get a good LIDAR image, we have to understand whether that's worth the, the time investment in, in, you know, for based on return we want. But I think one of the things that we are interested in pursuing is Apart from the image of the fire, but, you know, if we can get to a point where well, we take an image of it, um, what are the fuel loads ahead of that? Now, we do um, map where areas have burnt uh, by both fire and hazard reduction burning. But I think that um, sometimes it's quite difficult to understand how complete the uh, previous fires have been and how much um, of the fuel um, was removed. So I think that there's some, there's some good work to do in understanding whether the, the sensors that we're mounting to this aircraft or indeed other sensors could help us do that um, because that again very much informs our prediction models. So if we, if we have good understanding of what the existing fuel load is, um, time since burn, accumulation rate, what the, the current fuel loads are, then it gives us a really good understanding of what the potential for those fires are. Okay, thanks, Rob. I 
can uh, can you learn or are you learning from defence in the sense of using satellites and drones to add to the the plane, the sensors on planes that need to fly into the area? Yeah, certainly satellites is something that we do look at. And I think that the, the problem we've had historically is getting the detail that we want from those satellites. Uh, and I think that that will come, but I think right now it hasn't been as responsive and to the level of scale that we need it to be. Um, we certainly use satellites to detect um, heat images and they give you a constant, you know, we, we, we have, um, we certainly use, I think it's the Himawari satellite and we use that to give us a, um, you know, like a, a number of heat signatures and it can give you a quantum in the absence of um, scanning the fires. But I haven't actually seen anything satellite based currently that would eliminate the need for us to do this. Um, with respect to drones, that's something that I think it's, a, it's definitely an emerging area that we want to keep monitoring um, over time. The difficulty for us is that you've got something, you've got a, a relatively big state like New South Wales is having something and having it get quick enough to an area um, to be responsive enough to an emerging threat, hence why we've got a jet. And, and I don't know that we certainly don't have any drones on the commercial market that would be able to do that. And one of the other restrictions is, um, I guess the uh, where you put a drone up at the moment, we have we don't have any other aircraft flying because the risk of collision. So um, there, there's a whole lot of airspace restriction issues. And one other thing I'll add about drones is um, we did look at bringing one out as a trial. For us to bring one out from America of one of the military grade drones out to trial was more money than it costs us to buy a jet and put a, a pilot and an operator in it. So. That there has to be something about cost effectiveness there as well. So if, if it's costing more than having a person in an actual jet, then um, maybe the market hasn't come down enough yet. Okay, thanks. And that segues nicely into a question from uh, Samuel from Sydney, who asks, how heavy and expensive is the sex sensor technology? And is there a chance that they can be used on lighter aircraft that are possibly cheaper? Yeah, they can. They they um, they are they're fitted. The sensor is not heavy at all. Um, it's it's fitted to the jet because it's a multi-purpose. Number one, it's to get to the location quickly. Um, number two, because it's multi-rolling as a lead plane for the large air tanker, it's got to keep up with the large air tanker. The large air tanker is a seven three seven jet, so it um, it's got to keep up with that. So these aircraft can do that, and and it's a lot cheaper for us to multi-roll. Um, two platforms into one as such than have two separate platforms. But look, these, um, I think these sensors, the Overwatch sensors, you can fit them onto drones. Um, so they're not massively heavy. Um, but look, the, the type of dollars, it's, it's, it, these, each one of these is over a million dollars, the sensor platform. So they're not cheap. But um, again, when you think about the work they do and how many how long these things will work and how many fires they will scan um, and the generated warnings from them, I think it's pretty good value for money. Okay, good. A question about the, uh, the uh, weather systems that mega fires create. Is it important to understand those in the immediate uh, throes of the fire and does the sensing or what sensing is important or necessary to handle them? Yeah, I think it is because I think, look, the, the prediction of fires um, turning to that those pyro events is, is something that there's indicators. So currently, um, and it's very much about things like the height of the smoke column and how high it's going and things like that are, are, are sort of indicators. So at the moment we have a, a band where a fire goes into a certain area and then it becomes... A potential um, and but I, but I think there's a lot more research particularly after the last fire season that needs to go into those type of events they used to be quite rare I mean you'd see you may see one every few seasons it wasn't something that was happening at a regular occurrence but we had I, I actually don't know how many we had in the last fire season but we had numerous of them it become almost a 
not necessarily daily, but every few days there was a fire that reached that, that threshold where it was potential. So I think sensing, though, particularly if we can get some good um, data as far as not just a perimeter, but some really intense understanding of, you know, the thermals of these fires and what they're actually doing, then maybe we might be able to predict them a little better. So I think the sensing will be um, really important for that and to feed back into the, the modelling for CRCs, for the bomb, for fire prediction models to try and make sure that we better understand that because we, we have a reasonable understanding, but I think um, there's a lot more work to do there. Okay. So there's a question from Jamil about ground-based sensors or possibly uh, even wearable sensors on the, uh, the people deployed in the field. I've seen they're already used are they as effective or complementary, synergistic? Are How these, useful are they compared to the aerial sensing? So these are detect fire detection yes. sensors? Yes, or what, sensors yeah. for whatever you need to pick up. Obviously, fire is the key one. Yeah, look, we've done a few trials um, historically with um, sensors on towers, um, camera-based sensors that detect fires and uh, to try and make sure we're getting them as early as possible. What we found, and look, and this was a few years ago, that um, the uh, detection rate versus the normal call rate of the community wasn't hugely variable. So we were finding out about these fires around the same time that we were getting them through traditional methods. But I think it's fair to say that was quite a number of years ago. And I think that the, the technology has emerged significantly since then. So I think... Um, you know, it's something we should look at and we should maybe do some more trials on something like that to try and understand, is the technology there? Um, could we put them on some strategic locations that have really good, uh, you know, visual around it um, to try and um, see if it can make a difference now? I think the time's right to do that. So we'd be quite interested in uh, exploring some trials on something like that. Okay. Uh Frank from Sydney asks, to what extent do you use sensing before the fire season to assess the risk and probable, possible mitigation prevention strategies? Well, look, currently it's not used heavily. Um, we very much use... fuel uh, accumulation rate that very much drive where particular risks are. Um, but as I mentioned before, the flaw in that is just simply we don't have a good understanding of how complete the burn was. And I'll give you some examples of that. Like we had a um, we had some hazard reductions, for example, in the last fire season that stopped some fires dead and worked really well. We had other ones where the fires burned straight through them as if they weren't even there and they were only a year or two old. So we've got to do more work to understand when we say we've done some sort of um, hazard reduction, what, how much fuel residuals there. And I think that's where maybe um, sensors could come into helping us do that. So um, maybe this is something we'll do some tests once we get these aircraft to see if we can understand if it will help us do that. Um, and again, we'll be uh, looking for some support um, from the smart sensing network to help us actually see if we can actually do that. Okay. Oh, great. Another question uh, about gas sensing, which of course is important on the ground and in the uh, communities that surround fires uh, to test in particular for air quality. Presumably they're already deployed. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, look, we certainly don't have them. Uh, we don't deploy them, but, uh, but I think um, health and um, EPA have some uh, and I know they were deployed. Um, certainly, the, the, the certainly the smoke, um, the density of smoke. There's there's ones, and, the, and I know they were deployed in uh, Port Macquarie um, over the the fire season, where there was a, a fire, an underground fire, and it just burned for months and just kept popping up. Um, and it put a lot of smoke over Port Macquarie itself, where quite a lot of um, elderly residents live. Um, obviously, Sydney's got a quite a, a network of um, sensors for smoke. But I don't, um, we don't currently use, um, you know, sensing technology as far as either smoke uh, or whether there's other gases in the uh, atmosphere. So, no, it's not something we do. Um, mm -hmm. but 
but I think it's something again as we we understand more um, of the effects of uh, smoke, bushfire smoke, and the carcinogen effect of that smoke on individuals. I think it's something that we do need to pay more attention to, and whether that's a vehicle mounted, um, you know, ultimately even individually um, issued um, is, I, I guess, time will tell. But it's something that I think will become uh, something we need to deal with. Mm. And it's also a bit out of your immediate role, but there are some questions coming in about detection of moisture of the state of the vegetation, presumably the numbers of uh, animals that are that are likely to be impacted or have been impacted. So what what do you what what can you tell us about uh, about those sort of measures? Who who is uh, responsible for that sort of surveillance? If not so the, the rural bushfire service, and how do they go about doing it? Yeah, so for the, for the moisture uh, detection of fuel, that that's very much so. The Bureau of Meteorology will monitor those and provide what's the current, um, you know, what we have as a drought factor, um, and that's very much model based and, and and based on weather stations that are around the state to to inform that data. As far as um, you know, native animals that are in a particular area. Um, to my knowledge, there's no, um, I mean, apart from understanding that you might find in, say, a national park, there might be understanding of numbers of species, particularly things like koalas in particular areas. But I don't think there's an understanding on a, on a you know, a particular year um, how many of uh, those animals are in the path of potential fires and that. That's not something that's done. Uh, I don't even know how you go about that, to be quite honest. Okay. Good. I think that's the last question. Is that correct? I'm getting a thumbs up. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much, Rob, for uh, giving us your time to present and to answer questions and also to raise a lot of questions with uh, uh, that uh, are right in our uh, wheelhouse of the Smart Sensing Network. And we will be speaking to you as we obviously uh, want to design some projects that will help you ahead of the, uh, the next bushfire season. So thank you very much, Rob. Look forward to it. Thank you for much having me. Much clapping. Thank you. Thank you. Now we turn to the expert panel that we've convened for this uh, New South Wales Smart Sensing Frontiers in Sensing Forum. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, you to my colleague, Dr. Catherine Woodthorpe. AO, who will moderate the panel discussion. Uh, Catherine is an experienced chair and non-executive director. Her current roles include as chair of the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre, the Antarctic Science Foundation and Fish Burners, which is an organisation that uh, fosters Australia's startup communities. Uh, during the last 20 years, Catherine has served on boards across a broad range of innovation dependent industries, including healthcare, renewable energy, and environmental and climate science. She's recognized as one of Australia's most influential people in innovation. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks very much, Susan. Thanks for that kind introduction. And my thanks also to Rob for that really illuminating um, discussion that he provoked. Although we're deep in the COVID pandemic and extremely and reasonably distracted by that, the next fire season is only three months away and the response agencies and research community are working hard to implement learnings from last season when we gather those results. The science community were gathered earlier this year in a series of round tables by Minister Karen Andrews to look at what they could contribute to improve responses next year, next season, including technology-based solutions. Among the challenges presented to response agencies are early detection and management of, and suppression of fires, especially those in remote locations, predictive modeling of fire behavior, real-time geolocating of trucks and of people, including when regular communication systems are down, 
understanding the behavior of vegetation in order to understand, to feed that into our predictive modeling and many others. Today, we've pulled together a panel of four people with a wide range of skills and backgrounds to discuss this topic. I'll introduce them one by one, and they'll each have five minutes to give their remarks about the issue as it pertains to their area of work and skill set. We'll then, after they've all finished, have about 20 minutes of Q&A for you to put your questions to the panel. Um, several of you have already managed to work out the bubble in order to add your questions, so please feel free to keep using that during the course of people's talks because we'll curate them and come to them uh, during the course of that, and then I can feed them to the panel at the end. Our first speaker today is Andrew Gissing. Andrew is a nationally recognized risk and resilience expert. He works with government, business, and not-for-profits to make our communities safer. Andrew has over 15 years emergency management experience, including in senior executive roles. He's an emergency risk management and resilience expert. He previously held the position of Deputy Chief Officer and Director of Emergency Management and Communication for the Victorian State Emergency Service. And before joining Risk Frontiers, was the Director of Enterprise Risk Management at the Department of Family and Community Services. Andrew holds a Master's of Science and a Bachelor of Economics, so that's an interesting combo, and is the author of some 30 journals and conference papers. He's a graduate of the AICB and a certified business continuity practitioner. Over to you, Andrew. Unmute first. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to put myself. Uh, so, thanks very much, uh, Catherine. Uh, and uh, I'd really like to uh, touch on some good points that Rob made there throughout the conversation as well. I thought. His presentation was very good. Let me just introduce a little bit about uh, what we do uh, at Risk Frontiers, firstly, the organisation that, uh, that I'm from. So at the core of our work, we're a uh, catastrophe loss modelling company. Uh, we uh, have, have come out of a, a relationship with Macquarie University where we started off and really focused on servicing the, uh, the global and uh, local insurance industries with uh, catastrophe loss modelling. So catastrophe loss modelling is, uh, is, is a really complex uh, set of uh, models which enable us to look at and forecast losses from various uh, natural hazard events, including bushfire. So we have a uh, bushfire model for, for Australia, for instance. So what, what we do, uh, and I'll use uh, bushfire as an example, um, we come up with a lot of information from remote sensing, actually, to inform uh, a, a hazard module, which enables us to look at the probability of bushfires in various locations across Australia and really focus on that uh, hazard component that uh, threatens communities. We're then able to look at the exposure that communities have to bushfires. So, you know, where are the assets? What type of assets are those? And then ultimately, what's the vulnerability of those assets to, to loss? So uh, being able to say, OK, with fires actually impact here, how much is that actually going to cost the community in terms of various impacts? And Ultimately, uh, you can then use those to, to make decisions around cost benefits, around disaster mitigation, and uh, insurers can use that to, to better price risk as well. So we, we do that across, as I said, a, a number of different uh, hazards. One of the things that we've done, which really fits in well with this forum uh, uh, today, is uh, in, in February this year, we, we ran a forum with uh, a number of our partners, our insurance partners, but also other organisations uh, from uh, from this space. So we worked with Defence Science and Technology, CSIRO, organisations like Swiss Re, IAG, IBM, uh, some of the startup community as well, to really have a brainstorm about, well, what can actually be possible in this space? Uh, you know, emerging technologies, helping to focus on bushfire. We've written a paper on this. You can have a look at our website around future firefighting efforts uh, in Australia. The key thing that came out of it is that we think that there really needs to be a focus on a future capability plan for Australia with, with bushfire in mind, something which is you know, highly aspirational, really looking at uh, how we can use some of the things that you know, just came up in that discussion. But, you know, it needs to focus on the short term and, and the long term, you know, short term, you know, really looking at what technologies we can repurpose. You know, there's a lot of technologies in the mining sector, the agricultural sector that could really have a lot of uh, you know, purpose in the bushfire space as well. You know, some of the stuff we we're just talking about there in terms of emerging satellite technologies, 
to really get through that problem that Catherine just spoke about in terms of being able to detect these fires and then rapidly get resources to them. But also one thing that the, the group thought that really need a lot more research and innovation work that really wasn't solved by any sort of existing technologies and repurposing them, and that was the, the, this vision of almost autonomous firefighting, where uh, through, through utilising data and, uh, and technologies such as uh, you know, aerial drones and, and, uh, and ground-based uh, drones as well, uh, being able to detect fires autonomously, make autonomous decisions, uh, prioritise using modelling, and then being able to dispatch rapidly across the fire ground uh, resources to suppress these fires. And, and ultimately, with the aspirational game of you can put fires out before they start running on these really bad days, so you actually reduce uh, the spread significantly of bushfires and therefore the overall risk. Now, that's an aspirational objective. Uh, but, you know, if you look at things like the Defence White Paper and, and things that, uh, you know, in other fields around capability, uh, that's what we've got to focus on. We've really got to think about how we're going to be fighting these bushfires in 2030 and beyond. Uh, so, you know, look at 2040. How are we going to be doing this? What do we need to be doing now so that we can realise some of these possibilities in these future time steps? So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks very much, Andrew. And I've no doubt that will raise a few questions from people. Next to speak is Dr. Marta Yebra. Marta is a senior lecturer in environment and engineering at the Australian National University and Earth Observation Mission Specialist of the ANU's Institute for Space. So that's an interesting uh, role to have, Marta. She's also a member of the Australian Space Agency's EO Te Technical Advisory Group and DELP's Scientific Research Panel. Her main focus is on using remote sensing data collected by sensors on the ground or on board airborne or space platforms to provide accurate and timely information on vegetation properties that drive fire danger and therefore are essential for fire management decision making. Over to you, Marta. Thank you, Catherine. Well, uh, like many in the audience, uh, I recently lived uh, a devastating fire season that indeed provided a first-hand example of the terrifying potential of climate change. So as the commissioner has uh, highlighted, uh, one of the ways uh, bushfire managers will address the challenges of increased increase, uh, bushfire activity is through the mod modernization of the tools they use uh, to make their decisions. And remote sensing, as he has already shown, uh, technology has a, a, an important role to play in that regard. So remote sensing data taken by many different platforms, uh, the commissioner mainly focused on airplanes, uh, uh, can be used to derive uh, critical bushfire information, not only for the pre-fire, uh, sorry, not only for the during fire phase of, of the bushfire management, but also to, uh, for the pre-fire and the post-fire phases. So the kind of information we can derive is uh, related to the fuel conditions, so how, how much fuel is in a place, how wet the fuel is, and also uh, post-fire uh, was the, the consistent impact and the recovery. So I think overall, Australia makes a very good use of the available uh, data. However, there are opportunities for improvement and I'm going to, to dedicate the rest of my time in, in, in this. So, so firstly, uh, one of the main challenges uh, of using remote sensing for fire management, and this is especially true for satellite-based uh, sensors, is that most of the times uh, we rely on the use of sensors that have not been specifically designed for fire applications. So therefore the needs of fire managers are not always uh, fully met. So both in terms of spatial or temporal scales. So to meet uh, the, the end user's requirements uh, from sensors that have not been specifically designed for fire applications, uh, experts like myself have been combined uh, data from different sensors and systems, from optical to LIDAR uh, and rad radar and thermal optical with different spatial and temporal resolutions. So for example, um, uh, in terms of fuel moisture condition, uh, this is a monitoring in Australia using the 16 overseas satellite data that collects uh, data that doesn't fully fit the purpose in terms of the signal sensitivity, especially for Eucalyptus forest. Another example is the field and airborne laser scanners or a series of two-dimensional images uh, that can be used to reconstruct 
the three-dimensional structure of a forest, providing extremely detailed information of forest uh, fuel structure and load. But these observations are very local and mostly no operational given the high cost of collecting this data across large areas. However, the things are changing uh, in the last years, especially with the come of uh, and the proliferation of CubeSats, another cheaper and fast way to gather space data and dedicated sensors and missions have started to be developed. And there are a, a few initiatives for active fire detection. For example, the Canadian Space Agency is developing the wildfire SAT system. Fireball International is some company developed the Fuego system. And there is also a Germany uh, our space center uh, with the Firebird satellite. We also have a, a few uh, space uh, born uh, LIDAR system that were recently launched. So we will get more uh, uh, information about the fuel structure, for example. But however, in Australia, we still don't have an Air Force Observation mission. And therefore, we still heavily depend on data collected by other countries. So we can uh, either continue on the path of ensuring we'll have access uh, to that data in the longer term with the strong partnerships with international satellite operation. Or even better, we can explore opportunities for Australia space industry to, to develop and provide new satellite imagery capabilities uh, to secure access to key bushfire information. So at the ANU Institute for Space, uh, we strongly believe uh, we should push for the second option. And we are at the moment leading for the development of the first satellite designed to predict where bushfires are likely to start and those uh, that will be difficult to contain uh, based on the infrared uh, sensor sensitivity to variations on forest fuel load and moisture levels uh, across Australia. So just to conclude, uh, remote sensing technology has uh, already, as we've seen, and, and will in the future support fire management in Australia. But I think it's also fair to say that it probably won't prevent a future horrific bushfire seasons to come so on top of better information, we also need the governments and individuals uh, to take serious actions to tackle the underlying problem, which is the climate change. So thank you. Thanks, Marta. And I should have mentioned earlier that Marta is a, a key researcher in the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. So we're very proud of her work. Next up, we have Matthew Riley, who is a science director at the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. He has a proven track record of delivering policy-ready environmental research and services that deliver significant public good. He has delivered multi-million dollar programs in climate change impacts and adaptation, greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution, and energy and energy efficiency programs for the New South Wales government that have led to significant benefits for the people and businesses of New South Wales. Matt leads a team of climate and atmospheric researchers technicians, programmers, and analysts that study and observe the climate, urban air quality, meteorology, gas emission, greenhouse gas emissions, and energy systems of New South Wales. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Pond, uh, Gooding, and uh, Eggleton for inviting me to. But of course, it's not just the monitoring of air pollution that we do as well. Uh, you would have seen uh, during the recent bushfire crisis, uh, our air pollution forecasting and our air pollution alert system. These are two critical systems that the New South Wales government operates. One of them, the alert system is linked directly to our air quality monitoring uh, networks. And what happens is when we record uh, air pollution levels that go outside of the safe limits or uh, above our air quality standards, we issue automated alerts, alerts to um, the community. And these alerts are issued across the state in many, many regions. We also do air quality forecasts and have been delivering air quality forecasts for nearly 50 years. Uh, I've got an air quality forecasting team who works very closely with the Bureau of Meteorology and the RFS when we have fires and during the hazard reduction burning seasons uh, to ensure that we understand the impacts of smoke uh, from bushfires and from hazard reduction burns uh, across New South Wales. 
part of our services too is we operate emergency or incident air pollution monitoring. And Commissioner um, Rogers mentioned that today uh, in his uh, in his discussion that during the bushfire season we were able to put out emergency air quality monitoring stations on the north coast at uh, Lismore and at Grafton, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie and Taree, and also on the south coast at Ulladulla, Batemans Bay, Bega and inland uh, at Cooma. Uh, we also had established some new stations at Armidale and Goulburn earlier in the year. So from these stations, we were able to get a really good understanding of air pollution uh, across much of New South Wales during the bushfires. Also, we were able to put out some good air quality forecasts that not only helped New South Wales, but also helped Canberra. Our air quality forecasting uh, assisted our colleagues in ACT Health in understanding the air pollution impacts on, uh, on, on Canberra during their worst uh, exposure to the smoke. But we saw some real challenges during this bushfire season. And it's one of those old ages, you can't monitor everywhere, even with the cheapest possible the sensors, you can't monitor everywhere at all time. Uh, and of, not at the scales that you need, even uh, satellite based sensors, the ones that are geostationary often don't give us that fine detailed information. So there's this challenge that we face, which is how do we bring together, as Marta mentioned, um, lots of different platforms and lots of different approaches so that we get an optimal outcome for us. Smart sensing technology, in particular low cost sensing for air quality uh, can provide a, additional information for us. As I said, we have 90 plus air quality monitoring stations in New South Wales, but with low cost sensors, we can grow that into the many hundreds. And in particular air quality sensors that might be used as part of citizen science projects, members of the community putting their own air quality monitors in, uh, putting their own sensors in and then making that data publicly available to everyone. That's on the air pollution side. Commissioner Rogers uh, mentioned as well some of the challenges with uh, looking at weather and in particular fire weather. We're quite fortunate each of our air quality monitoring stations is also a weather station. So we have an additional 92 weather stations that adds to our information of what's happening on the ground. But there are also some challenges in understanding what's happening with our upper atmosphere or the atmosphere around those severe bushfires. Commissioner Rogers spoke about um, pyroconvective events. So these are the really dangerous ones where fires and fire conditions can change very, very quickly. I think there's a real role with sensing and not just a, um, a high cost sensors such as sealometers uh, that we operate, but lower cost sensors, lower cost LIDAR sensors that can give us really good information about the vertical structure of the atmosphere help us identify closer in to the fire fronts and the fire fields, whether or not these uh, fires may turn into uh, pyroconvective events. And that will give us a heightened sense of how, um, how we could manage those fires. And there's a few other things as well. Um, you know, just simple on ground sensing ahead of fire fronts that might give us a better indication of fuel loads and fuel conditions. Uh, so they can feed into the fire modelling system such as Phoenix that Commissioner Rogers mentioned. So I think there's a lot of uh, areas there where sensing can uh, really help us um, probably right now. And thinking about what, uh, what Andrew said about the future, help build that foundation for the future so that we have uh, um, a very much uh, world leading uh, sensor based, uh, intelligence based uh, air quality, air, air, bushfire monitoring and management system as we move into the 2030 towards 2030 and beyond i think a lot of the fundamentals are there uh, in particular when it comes to, to air quality but also um, weather and uh, and other monitoring so i think there's some really good options there and there's a lot to learn from this past fire season as well about how we respond to these events i look forward to your questions thanks very much matt and one of the issues you mentioned, pyroconvective events, and so did the commissioner. And of course, we must remember that that was what actually killed one of the firefighters, where a truck was, a 10 ton truck was bodily lifted, held in the air, and smacked down on its roof. So the sheer power of those pyroconvective events can't be underplayed. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. Um, finally, to speak as a panelist, I'd like to introduce Adrian Turner who brings two interesting strands together here, both in his former role at Data61 as the CEO there, and now with his role with Mindaroo. So he currently leads the Mindaroo Wildfire and Disaster Resilience Program. He also co-chairs OST Cyber and is building a new stealth venture, which I'm not sure if he'll tell us anything about that, but sounds fascinating. Prior to that, as I mentioned, he was the CEO of CSIRO's Data61, the data and digital specialist arm. 
Adrian spent 18 years in Silicon Valley and was co-founder of Barondi Group, co-founder and CEO of Makana Corporation. He had P&L responsibility for Philips Electronics Connected Devices Infrastructure and was chairman of the board for Australia's expat network, advanced.org, in a volunteer capacity. Adrian's a UTS graduate and completed the executive program for managing both companies at Stanford University. Over to you, Adrian. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, just, just as I start, uh, the background here is um, my brother's property in Kangaroo Valley. And the thing that really prompted me to play a role here was we got caught in one of those um, pyro events where uh, on that really bad Saturday, two fronts converged just as the southerly kicked up. And uh, for 40 minutes, the front burned on itself as that uh, cloud collapsed and just just left a trail of devastation. So I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but I've experienced it uh, firsthand. Uh, the next morning when the RFS turned up, um, the first thing they said was we, we actually came here to pick up nine bodies. So feel uh, incredibly fortunate to be here and part of the solution. So um, two, two things to mention here. So the Mindaroo program was launched by uh, Andrew and Nicola Forrest and they pledged $70 million to three streams of activity, one around response recovery, which includes mobilizing volunteers and um, implementing temporary housing. But the piece I'm leading is focused on resilience. And it's focused on how do we drive uh, systemic change. The program uh, is a $50 million program from Andrew and Nicola and Mindaroo Foundation, but we have line of sight to north of $100 million of uh, contributions. And our ambition is to turn this into a $500 million program and, uh, and, and we're well on the way. Um, the program is going to be divided into two uh, streams. One is short-term interventions that can be made ahead of the next fire season. And the second one is uh, longer-term missions, um, which I can come back to uh, in a little while. But we've identified four themes and we've been incredibly active out on the ground in communities um, on the heels of the recovery response efforts uh, and talking with many groups who are represented and uh, represented at this event as well and uh, launched last week a strategy for the program along with 26 partners, including uh, seven of the top 12 ASX companies, uh, insurers, reinsurers, um, Academy of Sciences, um, AFAC, MBRA, um, of course, the um, Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC as well, and we're delighted to be a partner um, and be partnering. So um, those four areas are enhanced prediction uh, enhanced response, resilient landscapes, and resilient communities. And the resilience landscapes is predominantly focused on uh, instrumentation of landscapes. But if I just um, speak for a minute about the role of uh, machine learning and data, uh, where we see enormous applicability here for both uh, prediction uh, and response for developing uh, higher resolution, higher fidelity uh, risk models. Um, also the, the spread modeling. So at Data61, um, the team uh, has done a lot of work on Spark and also looking at integration of Spark and Phoenix and particularly some of the spread, uh, spread modeling. Um, but, but for situational awareness and um, the commissioner mentioned before a need that We've also heard from many places around situational awareness and looking for uh, the combination of satellite imagery and different data types with on the ground sensing data, but also integrating um, citizen data uh, in a structured way that can be consumed and used by emergency services and first responders. Um, the, uh, the, the, the other piece that uh, we're very focused on is safety. Um, so safety for first responders and using machine learning um, and analytics for not only optimization of resource and allocation of resource, but overlaying uh, uh, safety as well. And, and that includes safety of citizens and evacuation modeling um, is another area that uh, machine learning and analytics holds enormous promise. 
But when we talk about machine learning and analytics, what we're really talking about is data. Um, it's really a data story here and there's gaps in data. And right now we've got uh, excellent work that's been done historically in modeling with incomplete data. Um, and, and as we found in the last season and I experienced firsthand, that those prediction models broke down um, in certain, certain instances. So a big focus for us will be also looking at emerging um, data linking technologies, federated analytics technologies, um, um, confidential computing, uh, so that data custodians don't necessarily need to share their data in order for emergency services to be able to link to it and derive insights from it. And um, uh, that, that also includes uh, data about built environments to, to be able to make probabilistic assessments of um, harm. The, the last thing I'll mention is just, although I've talked a lot about machine learning and machine learning applied to autonomous systems is fundamental, a uh, fundamental application as well um, of machine learning, computer vision, um, is the human factors. At the end of the day, um, our, our emergency services um, folks and do an, an incredible job. Um, there are people involved at the end of these systems, um, likewise with citizens. So one, one of the areas that we're also looking at is the social sciences, behavioral sciences aspects of how different people respond uh, during a time of crisis and uh, are, are looking to link up with uh, other countries. Um, I, I flew before, just before the lockdown, flew J to Jakarta and uh, um, we're looking to link up with uh, Indonesia's um, um, sister agencies as well to, uh, to, to help be a part of that social sciences, behavioral sciences work. Thanks, Adrian. That is a really interesting point. The social sciences side is something that the CRC has been really, um, really keen to and has always integrated with the um, technological sciences, if you like, in order to make sure that things can be implemented because at the end of the day, it's people that implement them. And so right. unless you involve the social sciences, um, you can just do all the science in the world, but it won't end up delivering outcomes. So can you right. agree there? Um, I'm going to kick off because I have the, uh, the pleasure of uh, getting the first question. So I'm going to use that privilege while we load up what I understand are quite a number of audience questions coming through. I'm going to kick off with one to Matthew. Um, so Matt, there's a lot of low cost air quality monitors out there. Why can't we just drop a whole bunch of them into the field? What's stopping us doing that? It's a good question, Susan. Uh, there are a lot of commercially available products out there. There's a lot of make your own uh, products out there as well. But one of the things that we have to be aware of is um, the quality of the data that comes out of them. And this is where Adrian spoke about machine learning and, uh, um, and, and artificial intelligence. Uh, we probably just don't have enough uh, sensors in the field at the moment uh, to be able to weed out using, using machine learning, what is the poor data? Um, if we had more sensors, and I'm thinking in the, in the terms of thousands, if not tens of thousands of sensors uh, in the field operated by citizen scientists, then we will be able to use machine learning and the AI that Adrian spoke about to be able to pull the good data out from the bad data. And look, even some of the bad data, when you bring uh, those statistical learning, those machine learning uh, to bear, you can tease some good information out of. But until we reach that sort of, that, that critical mass, it's very difficult. And sometimes with some of the lower cost sensors, what happens is you take away from the value of the high cost sensor that it detracts from the value of the, of the core system because there's a lot of people looking at individual sensors or small clusters of sensors and going, well, why is this read so differently from, uh, from the government's u butte sensors? We saw in particular during this recent fire season where I don't know whether too many people remember, but the fire season went for so long that we actually had lots of different air quality events during that time. Not only did we have bushfires, we had lots of and we're pouring over some data at the moment using some of the low cost sensors that we've been testing. Some of these sensors picking up smoke, absolutely fantastic. You know, you could spend $100, $150 on a, on a smoke sensor and it did a pretty good job. They just did not see the dust at all and they could not see the combination 
of dust and smoke events, which we saw a few times. So a little bit more work to do in this space, but I think it's really exciting. And it's when we get into those thousands of sensors in the field that I think we'll start to see that real marriage between the sensing technology, the machine learning that Adrian spoke about, the data blending that Marta spoke about, and we'd be able to really make a big difference in our intelligence, particularly around bushfires. I think that's the critical uh, synthesis of all of that, isn't it? It's absolutely the nub of the problem. I've got a question now for Marta. Daniel from Sydney asks, is there any way of developing a synergistic system that can combine local data collected by sensors with satellite, satellite data? Yeah, definitely. And that's, again, go to the question of integrating data. So I can give you a few of examples where that can be very, very good. So for example, in terms of fuel moisture content, that that's uh, my main expertise. Uh, we can use satellite data to, to have the broad picture of values or so very detailed uh, spatial resolution information for certain areas. But if you have a forest, for example, with a very close canopy and you are using optical data, um, you can only get the value from the canopy. So you will only be able to say how dry the canopy of that forest is, but you won't be able to pick up anything about the, the status of the understory. So if you have some sensor networks on the ground uh, to detect uh, those changes, you can then have an integrated value of all the fuel moisture content uh, values in the different layers of the forest. Uh, and that's a lot more useful for five behavioral predictions than just having the value from the canopy, for example. And then the equally important for active fire detection, uh, satellites uh, uh, sometimes have a very broad spatial uh, resolution that uh, are not able to pick up very small fires. But if you integrate this with on-ground sensors uh, mounted in cameras, although uh, the commissioner said that a few years back, this was not very effective, I think things has improved. Uh, so you can add more intelligence and information uh, to do the best of an integrated system. Thanks very much, Marta. I've got a question for Andrew now. Andrew, unmute. What's the modeling, what modeling capacity exists for Australia to best understand its disaster mitigation priorities now and into the future? Yeah, so uh, catastrophe loss modeling is absolutely well suited to that job. So especially into the future or so. So uh, what we're able to do with catastrophe loss models, that hazard module that I mentioned, we're able to use uh, climate projections and retrain the, 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 the models to basically forecast those hazards in the future. The other thing is, you know, we've obviously got changing societal conditions into the future as well. So, you know, playing some games where people are, are going to develop into the future based upon population projections and being able to really look at Future risk. Uh, we've recently just published uh, in the Australian Journal of Emergency Management uh, uh, an updated natural hazard risk profile for Australia. What we really see the intersection of this work is is that uh, you know you've got the Commonwealth Government uh, last year that came out with the uh, disaster risk reduction uh, framework and strategy for Australia. We would you know really uh, see the value of, of catastrophe loss modelling data and the outputs they're able to be derived from that to really assist in establishing what Australia's disaster mitigation priorities are. So, for example, what are the hazards that are, that are most uh, causing uh, disaster risk in Australia? What locations should the government be investing in? And what sort of treatments are most effective in managing risk? And you can see its application of the sensing uh, uh, conversation we're having now. What are the priority locations for sensors based upon the cost and benefit analysis that's coming out of the uh, the loss models and the economics associated with it? So certainly there needs to be greater data used in establishing uh, Australia's uh, natural disaster uh, priorities for mitigation. And certainly that data has been available now for a while. Uh, and, you know, there, there are obviously various models uh, out there that can be used. But certainly that the point that I'm making is we've got to be using that evidence and we've got to be using that data to make these evidence-based decisions. Very true, absolutely right. Um, I've got a question now for Adrian from RAM in Western Sydney. How can AI and machine learning linked to weather monitors help predict outbreak of fires in the future? What sort of sensors are we looking at for monitoring the hotspots on a constant basis? Adrian. Yeah, so look, I think um, Andrew did a pretty good job there of uh, answering um, a lot of that question. Um, and 
maybe what I can speak to, Catherine, is the overall structure of the program and the mission model, because it, it's a frame for um, enabling experimentation and different different types of sensing in the response. So if, if you look at the innovation system in Australia and the way that it works today, it's predominantly push. It's predominantly research push, not always, but predominantly. And it's something that I experienced firsthand uh, in the last role. What, what we're doing is modeled on DARPA and modeled on even, you know, the Apollo mission saying, you know, by this time, we want to deliver this outcome, this multi-jurisdictional, um, multi-technology outcome that amplifies good work going on inside of the country and around the world across these different set, sensor techno, technology types and um, serves to help them with funding and support and integrate them into um, a deployable solution. And um, that's that's a very different model to the way that uh, all, all but I think the next gen tech fund uh, out of the Department of Defense works today. And we've uh, got Karen O'Connor who helped stand that up, who's leading the missions part of this, uh, this program. So I, I guess it's a call out to everybody um, who, who's listening and paying attention, um, um, who, who has interesting aspects of, you know, either machine learning, AI models, um, sensing techno technology on the ground that, uh, you know, we're, we're really looking to grow the consortia to um, implement multiple field trials here over the coming months. You've already pulled together an amazing consortium so far. So, uh, yes, adding to that will we'll only enhance that. I'm very impressed at the rate at which you've managed to get things up and running at Linda. It's been fantastic. I've got a question that really, there's probably two or three people can, can chip in, and I'm going to throw to Matt first, um, which will come as a surprise because he hasn't seen this on the side, but we're talking about climate change here. Um, somebody's asking, uh, David in Cronulla has asked, have bushfire probabilities across Australia increased in line with climate change over the past years? And is there any data on this and what role might sensors have? And I'm, I'm thinking that Matt, and Marta and Andrew could all be actually adding to that conversation. So I'll throw to you in that order, but Matt first. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. It's a really good question. Um, and I actually think Andrew might be best place to answer, to, answer it at the, con at the continental scale and also um, in terms of observations. But what we have seen is we've certainly seen uh, trends in the number of extreme fire weather days. We've seen the forest fire, the cumulative forest fire danger indices go up across much of Australia and in some areas in a significant way. Also what we've seen too is a narrowing because of the change in FFDI is a narrowing in the window available to undertake hazard reduction burning activities too. So it sort of cuts both ways in that uh, we're potentially having a longer fire season, which also means that it's a shorter season for preparation uh, and undertaking those hazard reduction uh, events as well. And our climate change models uh, are all saying things fairly consistency uh, in, in fairly consistently looking at the seasonal changes that we're likely to expect to expect, particularly in southeastern Australia and also southwestern Australia as well. But maybe Marta or Andrew could add a bit more at that continental scale. Um, go up to Andrew first, then. Yeah. So, uh, like on the sensor component, obviously, absolutely key here is our. Uh, climate observational uh, data instrument network that is absolutely essential to looking at the changes in future climate and how it relates to the previous climate in the uh, you know, European history of our, of our continent. And, you know, the Bureau of Meteorology and Commonwealth Agencies, you know, with, with state-based organisations as well, are obviously really key to that. You know, one of the things which I know from, you know, my work is uh, stream, stream flow gauging in rivers is, is constantly a threat from, you know, various different changes in, uh, in bureaucracies, uh, ch uh, cutting of budgets, et cetera. And these, these records are absolutely essential that we actually understand what the, uh, what the water uh, flow is in our rivers, especially for extreme events. You know, we understand, obviously, that some of the most extreme events that have happened in Australia in terms of, uh, uh, of flooding events actually happened in the later part of the 18th, uh, sorry, 19th century. So uh, having these longer-term data sets and continuing the quality of which they're collected is absolutely essential when we're talking about climate change. Indeed. Mark, did you have something to add on that particular discussion? Well, I think they cover very nicely, but perhaps I could say that uh, coming back 
to this far season early as early in September, uh, satellite draft products were already showing that uh, the combined dryness and heat wave, heat wave records in 2019 was leading to a very dry vegetation across Australia. And this was especially true for the forests in the Eastern, Eastern Australia. And this all provided the fuel to, to, a, to a dramatic fire season that resulted in an unprecedented extent of burn area. So yeah, all leaked. Um, I've got a question from Joe in Sydney for Adrian. Is there an interest in wearable sensors for firefighters, do you know? Uh, yes, there is. There absolutely is. And um, the, the other area that we're looking at is if you, uh, one of the things that's coming out strongly is situational awareness and, and the timeliness of data and um, the role that citizens can play uh, as well. So it's, it's sensors for safety um, and, and providing situational awareness. Um, it's also thinking about the community more broadly and the role that they could play um, in providing situational awareness in a more structured way. Indeed, and, and Joe, to, to add to that, certainly um, looking at the firefighters themselves, um, obviously temperature, wearing all that gear overheat them very quickly in what is already obviously an outrageously hot environment. Um, dehydration is also a, a real problem for firefighters, you know, and following on from that, of course. And it's uh, not uh, not um, probably understood as much, but there's a number of cardiac events that occur for firefighters because of those things. So having a better understanding of the, uh, the behavior of firefighters' bodies while they're facing fires and uh, leading up to it is, uh, is something really critical as well. So yeah, very important area. Um, I've got a question here for Matt. Matt, is there an interest in the composition of smoke and its toxic component and possible impacts on human health? Uh, yes, a big interest in, in this. Um, what I can say is I know that all the epidemiology and all of the results internationally uh, do point to some clear um, outcomes. That is, it's actually the mass of the smoke that, that provides the greatest impact on human health. Uh, what matters a bit less based on the current epidemiology that we know from around the world is the composition of that smoke. But partly that's because we lack a lot of really detailed data into what is the composition of bushfire smoke, how that changes based on the intensity of the fires, uh, also the species that are, that are burning as well. We were quite fortunate. Um, there, there are a few fortunate things from a science perspective out of this very unfortunate uh, season. And we had some very detailed measurements of the composition of bushfire smoke as part of the Koala Joey's campaign that uh, University of Wollongong was leading and we were partnering with, where we had a vast array of air quality monitoring instruments at the Cataract Dam and were able to sample uh, in great detail uh, the bushfire smoke from, smi from fires around there. That will give us a wealth of information. But on the sensing side, this is where things can, can really help because there are some really good low cost sensors that measure volatile organic compounds. And again, if we put uh, those into the field in, in greater numbers, we should be able to get a better indication of, of, of how the smoke changes, how its composition changes. And then of course, uh, Commissioner Rogers spoke about the sensors on the new aircraft. And I'll be having a conversation with him because I'm very interested in particular on the infrared channels on the new sensing technology because we know there's a number of air pollutants that are sensitive um, to uh, different uh, wavelengths uh, in the infrared spectrum. So I'll be having a look to see what we can do there and also potentially uh, looking at whether there's other instruments we can put on those aircraft uh, to collect that valuable data that we need during bushfire events. Indeed, thanks for that. Um, Marta, I've got a question from Ian. Rapid initial attack is critical to stopping fires becoming large, dangerous, and hard to contain. What's the potential for real-time detection by satellite when fires start, especially from lightning in remote areas? We, we get dry lightning miles from anywhere. Well, Ian, you, you have described very nicely the best potential of satellite uh, data, because that, that's the, the best situation that uh, you can use this kind of data, because Normally, the, the ignitions near uh, the urban areas or near populations are well detected, but are those remote areas uh, that are a lot trickier. And of course, as the satellites are looking from the sky uh, at a very broad scale, there is a lot of potential. 
there's a bit of limitation at the moment in terms of the spatial resolution that the current satellites uh, can collect data and therefore the, the minimum size of the fire they can detect because uh, if you are collecting data with IMAWARI 8, for example, that it has a two kilometers spatial resolution pixel, uh, the fire will need to be already quite large to be detected by that uh, fire. And then the location is not going to be very accurate because it will tell you there is a fire in a two kilometers area. So there's a lot of potential to improve there uh, and CubeSats are a, potentially a good way to go. Are we constrained by the fact that the, we don't actually have those satellites in MRE8 and others are not our satellites? How do we arrange to make sure that we have the kind of data and sensing that we require on such satellites when we don't own them? Well, well, that, that's a big question. <laughs> and uh, that was the, the point I wanted to bring indeed. So now uh, the imagery for natural disaster management is uh, freely available or purchased from foreign providers. And this has many disadvantages. First, we spend a lot of money uh, every year on satellite images from oversized providers. And sometimes even we buy imagery twice. Uh, and second, uh, when we rely on overseas uh, providers or satellite missions, we get what we get, but we cannot get upset. <laughs> so we cannot design our sensors uh, to fit our purpose uh, to fit Australian conditions. So uh, there's a huge benefit in trying to, to bring uh, the space industry to Australia. Indeed. Um, Adrian, uh, I have Joanne in Sydney has asked, what are the urgent and pressing environmental data gaps that sensing can fill? I think there's a broad category of uh, ground truth data, uh, which I know, know sounds, um, you know, it, it, it's broad, but it's, we've got models and we're making um, um, predictions about uh, ground truth data, but we don't have the sensors always to both train the models and to feed back into the models. So there was a comment earlier by Matthew about um, a, a model of uh, akin to citizen science of distributing sensors. Um, and the ag sector does that today um, in, in there, there are platforms that exist that do that today. Um, the, the other thing I just want to call out is um, that uh, part, part of the work that we're embarking on is to um, do an audit of all of the different available data types, the custodians of the different data types, and um, perform a structured gap analysis in what we're calling a resilience blueprint, which uh, we're forecasting to be released by the end of June. Uh, and then underpinning that and related to that um, are setting out to build a uh, resilience data commons where we have a data sharing regime for custodians and others that can publish to um, a, a data commons that uh, can be made available to government industry and the research sector that would also allow for dynamic linking of uh, ultimately dynamic linking of government data with industry data with the right sort of certification mechanism sitting underneath that. So it's, um, in, in some cases, it's not that the data doesn't exist, it's that the data is, is not made available to the right third parties to be able to ingest and um, use the data. Um, and that, that would be a, you know, a massive national effort to create that sort of, a, that, that sort of an infrastructure, but we think could, could be uh, could be compelling, and, and we're testing that over the next two to three months. And are the Australian Data Research Commons able to be part of that? Are they already talking to you? Yeah, absolutely. So this is not an um, exclusionary thing at all. It's uh, um, identify who's doing good work already and amplify that work and um, fill, fill gaps where there are gaps. Fantastic, thanks. Um, Marta, to follow on from that data question, it seems that we might well have as much data as we wish, as you say, from a number of different providers, third parties and other and ground truth and um, in the sky, on planes, on the ground, etc. Is there any barrier on the use of this vast amount of remote sensing data in an operational context? Yeah, good question. Yeah, well, 
I cannot see any impossible barrier, but there are of course challenges that we could overcome. So firstly, um, the data received by remote sensing sensors need to be converted into useful information. Uh, so and, all, and not all fire and emergency agencies have enough uh, remote sensing experts to process and interpret the data, especially during a fire crisis uh, like, like the one we just had. So for example, last year I was called out to go to the New South Wales Rural Fire Service uh, headquarters because uh, the Rural Fire Service was to activate the international charter for space and major disasters. And the fire service uh, considered they were shortage of experts to deal with the large uh, range of raw satellite data they will be receiving. So I guess an important uh, thing is uh, to have uh, data systems and tools in place uh, to enable uh, to more easily turn that data into information to support emergency uh, responses decisions. And another aspect is that as, as the, we have more data and more information, for example, in the fuel condition, there will be also a need to develop new fire behavior models that can indeed process such data directly. As some of the fire simulation models currently used um, were developed uh, in the previous century and are not able to ingest uh, this information directly. Models like the, the, the Spark model from Data61 is, is uh, making a way forward into this, but uh, we are still not there. Yes, long way to go in, uh, in managing all of that. I've got a question from Andrew in Sydney, um, and I brought this up in my preamble as well that, oops, it's just moved. While many vehicles now have GPS tracking, can we investigate GPS tracking of individual firefighters to geolocate them? Such technology might allow localized geographical warnings to firefighters on the ground, for instance, and you can think of a number of different issues, you know, for firefighters down or, or, or other things like that. Um, so uh, who can I throw that one to, Andrew? Oh, oh yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, a really key question for firefighter uh, safety, actually, uh, especially those people who may not be aware with firefighting uh, with safety, there's a thing called code red warnings, especially when, uh, sorry, red flag warnings, especially like when wind changes come through, um, you know, warning firefighters of, of these conditions. And it's important to know where the firefighters are on the fire ground. So already there is technology which enables that to happen. So I don't think that's a technological problem. I think it's just a simply uh, an investment implementation and execution uh, exercise to enable uh, that to happen. And it should be a, a priority. And then as you, as the question suggests, absolutely inter interlinked with the uh, with the, these red flag uh, processes but i think the other thing that you, you your question goes towards is how best can we use sensing to more personalize warnings so uh, we know that through the social research uh, community uh, that the crc and others uh, produce some great social research we know that the more tailored the warnings are to the community the more likely individuals are to take action so how can we use, use sensing technology to actually help to tailor these warnings to individuals. And some of that might be mobility data, for example, that we actually know where certain uh, individuals actually are in relation to the fire front, such that those warnings can be absolutely tailored to those folks. We know that some of these warnings can be very broad, so that we're able to break them up into individual towns. And even if in the future you can get to almost individual uh, streets and right down the geolocated areas where these people are living and operating, that's a really big, that's a really big uh, ask and a really big uh, aspirational target. But uh, if you start to do that, you start with these warnings that are, that are getting right to the crux of, of people's own issues and, and using data to really help to uh, generate change and uh, get action during emergencies. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we've got time for a couple of more questions. Um, I've got one here. Is there a class of information for fire prevention or management that we can't currently obtain that would make a big difference? Or is it more about the density of information? Maybe Adrian can help me with that one. Um, so, so as far as we've got, uh, and um, I'd like to be able to answer this question in two months, two months time from now. But as far as we've got, one of the big problems is the tagging, the consistent tagging, um, consistent data formats, particularly across jurisdictions that allows for um, high, higher, higher resolution analysis. And also, um, you know, there was a fantastic um, vision of the future painted by Andrew uh, towards autonomous firefighting. And 
you can only automate if, if, if you've got structured data that can be interpreted by other machines and systems. And so, so it's, it's, it's normalization of data, it's, da it's data standards across jurisdictions as much as the data itself. Um, and um, again, I just come back to ground truth data because these models are only good as the training data um, that's fed back into the models. And it, it worries me a lot if we don't have ground truth data and we increasingly head off in this path of relying on kind of algorithmic decision support systems um, could, could lead us astray. Yeah, wise words. It's a question for, I'm not sure who to throw it to, you might like to put up your hand for me. Is, is Australia leading the world in the use of sensor technologies for bushfire prediction, prevention and firefighting? Matt, maybe you'd like to. Oh, it's, a, it's a tough one. In some areas, we're doing very well. Um, but, you know, Marta spoke to, about the, the challenges with satellites and the fact that we, we don't have a space program, so it's hard to... To, to get the sensors that you need up there. Um, but there's other things, um, Andrew spoke about fire protection and the way that we, we assist firefighters. So it's a really tough one. Um, uh, I think in some areas we are, in some areas we are. Should we be? Absolutely. Strong words and fair enough, absolutely. And, and if we take that to the last step, I'm going to give Andrew the lucky last word. What does 2040 look like in terms of firefighting if we've got it right? Yeah, well, uh, it's about being aspirational, isn't it? And I think we need to be a little bit in this space, a bit like uh, governments are getting towards the road toll. We, you know, the, you know, our climate trajectory is not great in terms of uh, future fire weather, but if we're able to do, uh, you know, set out the vision as I articulated before, uh, be aspirational, really look out 2030 and beyond, really set the research and innovation agenda that needs to happen. You know, a lot of things that uh, all my fellow panellists have been talking about here today, they really, really uh, worthy the investment and good to hear that, you know, people are starting to really start to uh, get on board with that, which is fantastic. But I think, you know, we should be looking towards, you know, a zero fatality toll. We should be looking at that we've actually reduced the ability of these fires to spread on catastrophic days and such that we're actually reducing the risk rather than seeing the, reduce, the, the risk actually going upwards, which it is at the moment because... We've got, uh, you know, uh, more frequent extreme fire weather and we've got more people living in a, in a bushfire, uh, you know, interface. So if we can see that coming down through better use of the technology, better public uh, policies around land use planning, around community resilience and, uh, and whatnot, uh, yeah. So, you know, obviously there's a big debate at the moment around the, the Natural Disasters Royal Commission, around, um, you know, plan burning and uh, vegetation management and whatnot. And, you know, that debate needs to happen and that's going to be on, you know, polar opposites on various sides. But I think the, the key issue that, you know, that really needs to be thought about is exactly what has been discussed here. And, you know, me personally, I, I think it's the one that's going to have the greatest impact, really. You know, let's get this, uh, this roadshow in to really look at what the future capability needs to be to achieve that aspirational objective of reducing risk rather than seeing it going upwards. That's a fantastic um, wrap-up, really. And, and uh, having been through the 2009 fires in Victoria and then, of course, this summer, that trajectory is well and truly established. When you look at what we faced this summer and the number of deaths we had, we're certainly on the right road and hopefully we can continue to head towards that aspiration of, of zero deaths and ideally minimum property damage and wildlife damage and ecosystems and, and everything else that suffers in these times. I'm going to thank all of my panel. I found that fantastic. I hope everybody out there did. I know there's hundreds on this call. So I also want to put it to you to think about what you've heard today, to think at the um, sensing network in the NSSN if you have further thoughts because um, there will be more to get from you, not just from us. Um, and so I think it's really important that we all actually have a part in this. Um, Adrian made a call out earlier for, from Mindaroo to see other collaborations that could arise. So please do, don't be strangers, make sure that we know where we can work with you, whether it's at the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, whether it's in our individual research capacities, whether it's Mindaroo and so forth. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for having me as your moderator. And I'm going to throw back to Ben Eggleton as the final word on everything. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Woodthorpe, wonderful to see you. Thanks to that panel, um, which was, as you said, Catherine, really uh, stimulating. And my job 
um, has been and will be to try to summarise, give a bit of a perspective on what uh, we've just discussed. I want to start by saying my name is uh, Ben Eggleton. I'm co-director of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network with Justin Gooding. I'm also a professor at the University of Sydney and I'm director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute. I'm particularly thrilled that this has worked so well because to be honest, we were really reluctant to engage the community in this conversation. We were nervous that people wouldn't have an appetite, the current crisis, that the timing wasn't good. And we eventually convinced ourselves that we can't afford not to have this conversation. We can't afford to let Australia somehow find itself in another crisis and not be prepared. It's our responsibility to really engage uh, the community. And I think uh, this has been fantastic. And um, let me say a little bit more. So today we focused on um, defining a role for smart sensors in bushfires. Justin gave a really nice explanation up front. We've really broken it down in terms of prevention and response mitigation. And we've heard from experts, thought leaders across the full spectrum, fantastic group of people about the challenges faced, about the promise of technological solutions that we must rise to the challenge and find a way of preventing, responding and mitigating these bushfires. I guess one of the overarching themes that we heard from the uh, commissioner, it's certainly not just more boots on the ground. We need new ways of thinking. So let me now try to give a bit of an overview of what we've heard just as a summary. So we started from Rob Rogers, New South Wales RFS commissioner, and he really presented, presented a perspective in terms of remote sensing focusing on the fires that are most dangerous, to use his words, um, with the aircraft that he described, heat densities, what is burning the hottest, and that feeds into a platform. But we then really talked about the next phase, and obviously this is about better outcomes. He made the point that over the summer there were almost 12,000 fires, 105 emergency warnings. Um, he talked about the Phoenix platform that has been, I think, very successful, and the recently adopted Overwatch TK9 imaging system, which sounds uh, a pretty exciting platform that uses seven multi-spectral bands to provide images uh, from various altitudes, um, which informs then how um, the follow on uh, implementation takes place. We talked about the integration of multiple aerial platforms we talked about how we can maximize the benefit of this technology in a collaborative way. He was quite honest about the fact that they're not really sure what's next in terms of whether LIDAR uh, provides a new degree of freedom. We had a bit of a discussion about satellites and I think he was honest that uh, really they're not that confident right now when we had, and I'll return to some of the interesting perspectives from Marta about the satellites at the moment, we don't own them. The data doesn't really match our expectations. We don't get the spatial temporal uh, perspective that we need. And similarly with drones, we had a somewhat surprising perspective that um, they're just too expensive. And the simple statement that it was um, cheaper to, I think he said cheaper to buy a jet and send a pilot up than it was to ship one of these um, drones from the US, which is kind of pretty breathtaking statement. So there's a bit of an issue. We've got to get on top of that because I think what we've heard is that drones and satellites are clearly part of the solution. So I think that set us up fantastically. Catherine uh, stepped in with her very um, high level perspective, great uh, wise based on her real credentials and made the point, look, we're only three months away from the fire season. Um, so um, we really need to be prepared. So we then had four pretty brief perspectives that I'll just touch on. I thought Andrew gave a fantastic perspective from the point of view of catastrophic loss modeling and he kind of teased out this idea of autonomous firefighting. So what does that really look like? Is that a serious proposition? How do, how do we bring that to, to real, uh, to detect, to prioritize, to rapidly dispatch, to put them out early? So I mean, it clearly senses AI, the type of machine learning that um, Adrian talked about plays a role. We heard then from Marta, um, great perspective from the Institute for Space, um, remote sensing, uh, looking at vegetation properties, uh, fuel conditions, made the point again that um, we don't have access to our own satellite, we don't have access to data, but presented a bit more of an optimistic perspective. CubeSats um, are coming online. 
Um, we need sovereign capability. I think that's an important theme that emerges in that conversation. That's a theme that we're hearing more often now, particularly in COVID-19 context. Um, and very excitingly talked about plans, or in fact, uh, efforts to design a new satellite for bushfire detection. So fantastic work. We heard from Matt Riley. Um, bit of a rough start there, Matt. We lost you in the first 90 seconds uh, with the acoustic, but fortunately you came back to us. A real emphasis on monitoring air pollution. Uh, talked about the fact that the department has already well-established um, sensors distributed across New South Wales that send out automatic alerts. They work with BOM on forecasting. They put out these um, regular alerts during the crisis. They were, able, they were able to introduce additional air quality stations in Armidale, Goulburn. They worked with ACT Health and really talked about, we can't monitor everywhere all the time. So how do we bring together different platforms? Uh, we talked briefly about low-cost sensors, a topic uh, very close to my heart, and made the point that, of course, citizen science uh, is a key part of that conversation. We need to make the data available. Um, and there obviously is an opportunity there. We talked about the simple fact that the atmosphere itself is very complicated. Um, we need to understand the upper atmosphere. Can we use LIDAR to, um, I guess, probe the vertical structure of the atmosphere, which will inform some of the more dramatic uh, follow-ons. And finally, um, we heard from Adrian Turner, um, representing, I guess, the Mindaroo Foundation in this context, and he gave us this very dramatic um, uh, entry point to his narrative from uh, his brother's property in Kangaroo Valley that um, almost ended very badly for him, but fortunately he's been able to uh, be part of the solution, uh, to use his words, but I think that's given him a real um, life experience. Um, talked about the uh, vision that Andrew and Nicola Forrest have in terms of their priorities for response resilience and the funding. I think he mentioned $500 million program that has a short-term and a long-term perspective. His message was very much around data and machine learning. Um, clearly, that's going to play a key role um, and that predictive analytics that will enable the high-resolution risk modeling. And eventually, really, at the end of the day, that's about situational awareness. And that, again, I would say that's an overarching theme. It's, it's a theme that's very familiar to me because I do a lot of work for defense um, sensing, and it's the same narrative. And I do think, from my own perspective, there's a lot to be learned from how defense, uh, the Air Force uh, in particular, is using uh, smart sensors um, in that context. Um, again, um, Adrian talked about data and the gaps in the data, the incomplete data, and the fact that, you know, as I've been listening to Hugh Durrett White for many years, data science can solve all of the problems of the world, but only if you have all the data. And um, there are gaps in the data. And I think that comes back to um, the census. So I think that's uh, a summary from me. I think that was fantastic. I appreciate everyone's uh, really fantastic contributions. I just want to end by saying, this is just the start of the conversation. Today is not the outcome. What we've really opened up, uh, hopefully, is uh, some good conversations, some good contacts. Um, we're going to take the learnings um, from today to build collaboration with university government and industry, frontline agencies and the communities. Uh, we want you to be part of the conversation. Uh, that is, we want the participants and the community to be part of the conversation. We're going to share a report from today's forum. So you will get an email. If you're registered, you're going to get an email. I guess that's going to be in the next week or two with a summary. Um, please reach out to the network. Please subscribe to our newsletter. And we'd love to talk to you. Um, with that, I want to thank you all. I want to say um, we appreciate your effort and time. Stay safe. Um, be well. And we'd love to hear from you. I look at Nick, my COO. Anything else I've missed here? Great. So have a lovely weekend, everyone. And we hope to talk to you in person one day. See you soon. Bye-bye.